Good morning. morning. Mr. Cameron, you will conduct the examination. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. We have Minister William Blair. Could I have the witness sworn or affirmed, please? Do you wish to be sworn? You, you, may, you may sit. Could you please state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? My name is William Sterling Blair. My surname is spelled B-L-A-I-R. Thank you. And do you, uh, do you swear that the uh, testimony you're about to give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God? So help me God. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Proceed. Good morning, Minister Blair. Um, I w wonder if the court operator could pull up uh, WIT 64. And while he is doing that, uh, Minister Blair, I'll ask you if you remember that you were interviewed by Commission Counsel on February 21st and then uh, examined in camera uh, by Commission Counsel. Uh, and uh, that we have on the screen now the public interview summary uh, that was prepared in respect of your interview. And can you tell me, uh, did you have a chance to review that document, the public version of it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Cameron. I do, I do of course, recall that I attended uh, both meetings. I have had the opportunity to review uh, the, the interview summaries, both for the public interview and the in-camera interview. Thank you, and uh, were they accurate? Yes, sir. Do you have any corrections you'd like to make now? No, sir, I, I believe they're an accurate reflection of the conversations that we had. Okay, and do you adopt them uh, as your evidence uh, in this proceeding? I do, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> if you could begin, Minister Blair, mindful that we uh, are a little bit constrained by time this morning, but begin by giving us your uh, role in public life and how you arrived at the position of uh, Minister of Public Safety. Yes, sir, I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I became a Toronto police officer in 1976, and I, and I performed a number of, of, of a wide variety of functions within policing, um, including in criminal intelligence and, and organized crime. Um, I, in 2005, was appointed the chief of the Toronto Police Service, um, and I held that position as the, the chief of, uh, frankly, the largest municipal police service in Canada for approximately 10 years until uh, April of 2026. During that period of time, I also served as the president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, and many other national and international organizations. Um, I retired from my policing career in, uh, on April 26, 2015. Um, I then sought the nomination to run uh, for, for federal politics in the riding of Scarborough Southwest. I was elected on April 19th, or excuse me, October 19th of, of 2015 and became a member of Parliament. In July of 2018, I was appointed to the Privy Council and the Cabinet of Canada as the Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction. Um, I, I then, following the election of 2019, uh, was appointed in November of 2019 as the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Following the 2023 election, um, I, I was, uh, a, 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 excuse me, the 2021 election, well, I haven't, didn't have one in 23, in 2021 election, I was appointed the Minister of Emergency Preparedness um, for, for Canada. And in July of last year, the Prime Minister appointed me as Canada's Minister of National Defence, a position that I currently hold. Thank you. And if I can just capture from within that mm -hmm. uh, chronology, if I understand correctly, you were Minister of Public Safety from about November of 2019, so shortly after the 2019 election, until about October of 2021. Uh, is that correct? Yep. Yes, sir. I held that. I held that position until I was appointed to a new position and, and another individual was appointed um, in after the following the election of 2021 to the position of public safety. Thank you. Now, we had the benefit of hearing yesterday from uh, senior personnel from the uh, Department of Public Security. So what I'd like to ask you about is your perspective uh, from the minister's chair, uh, uh, being the minister of that uh, uh, department and the uh, responsible person for the various agencies that report uh, to the minister. Could you describe that for the commissioner, please? Again, I, I'll attempt to do it briefly. As the minister of public safety, um, I, I had an, a, a number of responsibilities. Primarily, I was the minister of the Department of Public Safety, uh, which is headed by a deputy minister, but there are also five agencies.
agencies uh, for which I had ministerial oversight and responsibility. That included the RCMP, the Canadian Border Services, uh, the CSIS, uh, Corrections Canada, and the Parole Board. In addition, there are a number of other uh, review bodies uh, pertaining to those organizations for which I also had ministerial responsibility. There is legislation um, with respect to a, of the, the position of Minister of Public Safety defining some of those responsibilities. And in addition, each of the five agencies has foundational legislation that, that prescribes their authorities, but also defines the role of the minister with, in relation to those organizations. Thank you for that. And if you could just describe then, uh, in general terms, how you would relate or interact with, for example, the director of the service or the commissioner of the RCMP, how you as minister would relate to the heads of the various agencies for which you were responsible. Yeah, I, 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 I had a, a very close relationship with the heads of each of the agencies. My primary point of contact in the ministry was the Deputy Minister of Public Safety, Mr. Rob Stewart, throughout my entire, or through the majority of my tenure in that position. Um, that primarily pertains to issues around policy and, and other related matters to the department. Um, I also interacted with the Commissioner of the RCMP, the Director of, of CSIS, the President of CBSA, um, the, the Commissioner responsible for Corrections Canada and the Chair of the Parole Board, um, fairly regularly and routinely uh, meeting with them um, and, and, and they, they had opportunities to brief me on, on matters related to their portfolios and there were also um, for each of those departments certain authorities that I held over approvals for certain activities within their departments that they would, they would come to me for and seek those approvals. Um, and I'm just going to uh, note uh, that we're trying to keep things at a, a pace the interpreters, the simultaneous translators can keep up with, so I'll, I'll just keep, ask you to keep that in mind. Uh, in the context that you were just des describing, the uh, way that you uh, managed your responsibility for the various agencies, can you tell me what the role was of the ministerial directives that you might have occasion to issue with respect to any of the agencies? Uh, one of my responsibilities as, as, as minister was to provide direction uh, to the agencies that were under my portfolio. And, and the mechanism by, by which we would do that was with the issuance of a written ministerial directive that established priorities, for example. And, and I think pertinent to this discussion, um, I, I did have the opportunity to issue ministerial directions to both the RCMP and CSIS, outlining what... what I perceive to be the priorities of those agencies, um, and 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 the intention of, of of that was to give appropriate direction um, to the areas that I felt they, sh they should prioritize in their in in their work. And did you issue such a ministerial directive with respect to CSIS during your term? Yes, sir, I did. And did that ministerial directive make reference of the service's responsibility to investigate foreign? Interference? It, it specifically identified foreign interference as a priority for CSIS. As a matter of fact, in, in the list of, of priorities that were identified, foreign interference was the second on the list. I, and, and although it was not a prioritized list, I, I think its position there reflects the importance of which I put, placed upon it. Thank you. Um, now, noting that you became uh, the Minister of uh, Public Safety after the 2019 election, what was your perspective on foreign interference at the start of your term as Minister of Public Safety? I had had the opportunity, first of all, and as I've already mentioned, I had a very long uh, police career, and, and I was aware of the, the historically hostile activities of certain state actors uh, with respect to Canada and the threat that that could represent to the, uh, Canada's national interest, to Canadian citizens, to our critical infrastructure. Um, as in my previous role, prior to becoming the Minister of Public Safety, as the Minister of Border Security and uh, Organized Crime Reduction, I also had the benefit of some briefings uh, under the authority of, of, of then Minister Goodall, who was pre my, the previous Minister of Public Safety, um, with respect to information that was provided. And when I was appointed, when I became the Minister of Public Safety, I had the benefit of fairly extensive briefings with respect to the intelligence and the law enforcement situation, the public safety situation in the country, which included briefings with respect to issues around um, the hostile activities of state actors and, and the, the, uh, the wide variety of risks that that represented. Uh, 
Well, since you've, you've uh, mentioned that, let me ask uh, the court operator to pull up WIT 64. Uh, and if you can scroll to it, paragraph 13 of the uh, interview summary of Minister Blair. Um, Minister, the, you can see that in paragraph 13 of your interview summary, there's a description of your account of a briefing you received by CSIS after the 2019 election. Is this one of those briefings of the type you were just describing? Yes, it is. And can you be more particular about this one as it's discussed in your interview summary, the one about the uh, 2019 Don Valley North Liberal Party of Canada nomination? As part of a number of, of briefings that was provided to, to me by uh, the director of CSIS, there was a discussion about um, concerns that they had identified through their intelligence reporting about the nomination process in 2019 that occurred in Don Valley North. Um, and, and they provided me with information with respect to um, intelligence that they had received that, that called into question the, that, that nomination process, suggesting uh, that there, there may have been irregularities um, in, in the number of the people that participated in that and, it, and, and the possibility that it had been influenced in some way by uh, the activities of the People's Republic of China or, or representatives of, of, of that country. And in, your, uh, in paragraph 13 of your interview summary, you describe uh, your reaction to that briefing. If you look at the sort of second half of the paragraph, you have some numbered points about your reaction. Yes, sir. As I've indicated in, in previous roles in, in both policing and in my previous roles in government, I, I have a fairly good understanding of, of, of the nature of intelligence. Intelligence isn't necessarily uh, factual evidence of what took place. If someone perceives that this has happened, and, and so I made some inquiries during that briefing with respect to the source of that intelligence, that information, on, on to determine if I... To, from CSIS's perspective, the reliability of that individual, if there was corroborating evidence to support the intelligence that had been received, um, if there was other corroboration or, or manner effort to substantiate that allegation, um, it, 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 they indicated to me that they did not at that time have um, other corroborating evidence to, to in, in any way to substantiate that. Um, I also made inquiries if, if there was any evidence beyond the nomination process itself of interference in the electoral process that we had just gone through in the 2019 election. And they did not indicate at that time to me that there had been any impact during in, in, in that writing um, in, in, in any evidence of interference uh, following the, their concerns were limited only to the nomination process. Um, and, and, and my perception of that was, um, and, and my, my last question, was there any suggestion that the, the candidate was, was knowledgeable and aware of that and they had no information to corroborate that. Thank you. And perhaps if the court operator could call up a CAN 3326. Minister Blair, as you discussed in your uh, 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 in-camera evidence, you, uh, not long after your appointment as minister, you, uh, had an initiative, and this was mentioned by your uh, department in their evidence yesterday, so I'll just ask you again from your perspective as the minister, uh, if you can start by describing the motion on November 18th, 2020, to which the document we now have on the screen was a response, and why you responded to it with this report and letter to the MPs. Yes, well, there had been a motion on November 18th, 2020, in the House of Commons, with, with, when the House sought information um, on what the government was doing to address threats to the security, prosperity, and democratic institutions right across the country. And in response to that, um, well, I worked very closely with my department and, and some excellent policy work that was done by my deputy minister and, and his team, excuse me, along with my ministry office, uh, we crafted a response to that motion um, we also had discussion about, you know, frankly, tabling a response to a motion. In my experience, those, those don't not always receive the full attention of every member of, of parliament or the attention of Canadians. And I felt, I felt that it was very important. This information, I think, in order for Canada to defend its institutions, for in order to us to, to uh, take the steps necessary to respond to, to the threat of, of foreign interference 
um, it was necessary to inform my parliamentary colleagues, but also to inform Canadians of the nature of that threat, give them information on, on, on what risk it represented, and also information on how they could then respond. What, I wanted to tell my, my colleagues what the government was doing, but also to tell Canadians um, if, if they saw evidence of foreign interference. The, the, the response that is provided in this document did not limit itself, quite frankly, to just political interference. Um, there was a great deal of concern, which frankly I still hold, with respect to the hostile activities of state actors in interfering with a number of our critical infrastructure, our, 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 our life sciences and health sciences institutions, our research capabilities. Um, there are a number of cyber threats that, that are also quite significant and deeply concerning uh, to, to our national interest. And, and the purpose of this letter uh, was to inform my parliamentary colleagues and through my parliamentary colleagues by publishing this document and making it a, and tabling it in par Parliament to inform Canadians about the, the, the full nature of this threat and to inform Canadians about what their government was doing in response to it. Thank you. And on, it, it, with respect to a particular topic, this is a, a report of some uh, 12 pages long, but I just, if I could take you to one little section of it and ask for your comments if the Court operator could scroll down to page uh, 11 of this report. And if you look down under the heading protecting our citizens and communities, there is a paragraph that begins, Canada does not tolerate harassment or intimidation of its citizens. And you might recollect that in both your interview and in your in-camera evidence, we explored this issue of your concern as minister for diaspora communities in Canada and just noting that this is a part of your report. Could you comment on that for the Commissioner, please? Yes, yes, sir. Um, there was and, and remains a, a fairly significant concern about the activities of certain hostile states in, in harassing um, or intimidating our citizens. I made reference in this document, for example, to, to Operation Foxtrot, in, in which the, the, the government of, of China was attempting to uh, gather information and to intimidate uh, people in Canada. Uh, with respect to certain economic investigations that they were conducting. Um, I spent most of my life trying to keep Canadians safe, and, and, and that's, it's been my job. And, and, I, and I, I believe the, the best way to keep Canadians safe is to give them information on how to protect themselves, but also to, to tell them what steps to take when they, when they perceive that there is intimidation and threats taking place, that they're not alone, and that, and that, and that we're going to be there for them. And I, I was hoping to make that clear in this document that we would not tolerate it. And, it, and if they perceived that they were subject to intimidation or threat, um, the course of action of, of a, a hostile government, uh, such as the People's Republic of China, that the government would take it seriously and that we would respond. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears now and talk to you just uh, in a general sense about uh, the flow of information and intelligence to you as, as minister. Uh, not about any specific document or incident, but just generally speaking, and let me begin by asking you, did you have a security clearance to see classified intelligence? Yes, sir. I, 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 I hold, as a member of the Privy Council, but also be, as by virtue of the various positions that I've held, I, I have clearance for essentially the highest levels of intelligence, including right. some internationally shared Five Eyes intelligence. Right, so there would be no intelligence that you wouldn't be able to see if the appropriate agencies thought it was appropriate that you'd be briefed on it? I don't think there's any restriction on what I am able to be Thank made you. aware of. And uh, generally speaking, in your uh, tenure as minister, how did classified intelligence come to your attention? There were, there were certain, there's various levels of classification of material. Um, and frankly, I've always tried to be very careful with the handling of, of all classified information. And, and I, I, I frankly never take it from the room or make notes with respect to it because that would, in my opinion, compromise its security. In, in my role as the Minister of Public Safety, um, I generally have access periodically to some classified material, but virtually everything of a top secret nature was only shared with me in the confines of a secure environment, a SCIF. Um, generally, uh, throughout my tenure as a public safety minister, either in the SCIF at, I apologize. I may be subject to some form of interference there, Mr. <laughs> 
all top secret material was shared to me in the confines of a skiff, either at uh, 269 Laurier here in, in Ottawa, where there is a secure room where briefings could take place, uh, and that, in the same building as my, my ministerial office was located. Um, I also uh, attended on, on a number of, of fr quite a frequent number of occasions at the CSIS headquarters, which is located in Toronto. Um, where there are secure facilities where information would be shared for, with me in a secure room. Um, I would enter that room. Occasionally there would be secure communications. Either the director and his team would be present, the director of CSIS and his team would be present in briefings. Sometimes that was done virtually, particularly during the, the, the pandemic, where, where we were able to use secure communications for that purpose. And occasionally I would just be in the room and they would present a binder of documents that I would read through. If you could just... Uh expand a little bit on that experience again and describe for me who would be briefing you, maybe not the same group every time, but typically who are the personnel briefing you and who are the personnel with you on the ministerial side or the departmental side of those briefings? In every case, the briefing was done by the director with his team. And, and so the deputy director and sometimes their associate director um, would, would be present in the room. Um, in addition, not in every case, but in, in some cases, the deputy minister and, and other also of his team, um, his, his ADM, uh, Mr. Richon, would also be present in the room. And generally, my chief of staff would be present, certainly in the meetings that took place in, in Ottawa. And when I was attended um, to, to CSIS headquarters, I will tell you frequently I was in the room by myself. I was sometimes connected virtually um, by screens and sometimes uh, CSIS personnel would simply come in, present a, a, a binder of documents, and I would read through them. Thank you. I'm just going to ask if I can uh, clarify a, a detail in your evidence there. Um, when you talk about attending at CSIS in Toronto, uh, I think you're talking about attending at the CSIS regional, uh, Toronto regional office, right? Not yes, sir. I'm not sure whether you want me to give the address, but... No, no, you, I don't want you to do that, but it was, the, it was the Toronto regional office and not headquarters. Right? No, it's the Toronto regional office, Thank and you. it's, it, it's a place of because of all the work I did in Toronto, and I was also a member of the INSET team de right. dealing with national security investigations. I've, I've, I've attended there very frequently, but I, 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 I still, just in the past few weeks, I've, I've attended in, uh, high level in, intel, secret intelligence briefings there. That's been helpful. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Those are my questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Uh, first one is uh, Council for RCDA. Good morning, Minister Blair. Guillaume Sewa for the Russian Canadian Democratic Alliance. Yes, sir. Um, in your witness summary, you mentioned um, the evolution over time of misinformation and disinformation, correct? Yes, sir. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about this evolution? There are a number of ways in which foreign interference can take place. Some of it is you know, directed towards the intimidation or coercion of individual Canadians or, or institutions. It can also take the, the, the form of um, espionage in, in, in capturing information. But one of, the, one of the challenges that we face is in the way in which Canadians now receive most of their information um, through social media, there is an, a, a concern. I think a legitimate concern of misinformation and disinformation. And I would differentiate between them. One is just simply providing false information. Another has, has frankly, a more nefarious intent uh, to, to, to not just misinform, but to create um, a public perception, which is not based on fact. Um, and, and we have seen the activities of a number of hostile states. And, and, and again, I would, if I may, I will differentiate between a number of for all foreign states attempt to influence other countries and other citizens in their best interest. But through the application of misinformation and disinformation, uh, we, it, it meets the threshold of forward interference if it is um, deceptive, if, if it is uh, clandestine and, and clearly intended to, to create chaos and mischief and disagreement. Thank you. And I'm wondering why, why is this a concern for public safety? Is there a chance that this misinformation or disinformation um, becomes a real threat to the security of Canadians, like um, threats to violence and so on? 
Well, if I may, I, I, let me sort of reflect during the period at which I was the public safety minister. There were a number of efforts in, among our public health officials in order to take steps that were necessary in order to keep Canadians safe. But unfortunately, there was a, a great deal of misinformation and some disinformation. health efforts to keep Canadians healthy and safe. And, and so that can represent a, a threat to the public safety of the country. It also, um, what we have seen is one of the intents of, of, mis of disinformation is to create significant social division within the country. And, and you know, I think it is a, a well-protected right of Canadians to hold an opinion and 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 to express that opinion um, under under our charter. But at the same time, if if those opinions are being negatively influenced by misinformation with a nefarious intent to cause that social division, it can represent a concern for public safety. And is is what you just mentioned? Um, did you witness what you just mentioned specifically during the forty third and forty fourth general elections? The, the misinformation that we saw in, in, in there... Uh, just, just to clarify, yeah, uh, I'm talking not necessarily about the misinformation, disinformation online, but um, perhaps the transfer of this issue to real threats to public safety, for instance, blocking polling stations, um, refusing to wear masks at polling stations so that there was... Um, I, Frankly, we, we saw those as the, the, that misinformation and, and the, the reaction that it, it created um, was a challenge. But in my opinion, it did not rise the threshold as interfering with our ability to hold a free and fair election in Canada. Oh, OK. I, I, I was not questioning whether it, was, it, it met the threshold. I was just questioning as whether is it something that the public safety witnessed or was aware of during the, at least the 2021 election. Well, I, I can tell you, my officials did not brief me specifically on the impact of mis, mis or diff's information on the 2021 election, but I think all Canadians observed and, and, and recognized you know, the wide diversity of, of information that was, was, was being put forward. And um, I, 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 it, it was a concern, but it did not rise to the level that our officials came forward and said, this is something that we need to respond to. Okay. At least not to me. And you mentioned, and just my last question, you, men, you mentioned numerous hostile states in one of your pre previous answers about mis- and disinformation. Um, would one of those be Russia? Yes. And would Russia in Canada specifically or generally? Both. Canada specifically and generally. In, in our elections specifically or generally? I did, not, I did not see substantial evidence of, of R Russian efforts to influence our elections through disinformation. Um, I think, and, and we have observed um, a fairly concerted effort among a number of hostile actors, including Russia, to, to engage in disinformation within our society, but not specifically directed at our electoral processes in the 2021 election. 2021 and 2019. As well. in, in, in either election. I'm, I'm not aware of any um, activity by Russia through their disinformation campaigns to influence the outcome of that election. They were influencing other types of public uh, opinion, but I did not see evidence of it directed towards the outcome of our 2019 or 2021 elections. Okay, I'm out of time, but I thank you, Mr. Blair. Okay. Next is uh, Council for Human Rights Coalition. Hello, Mr. Sure. If I could ask the court reporter to please pull up CAN 3326. My colleague for the commission has already brought this uh, document up this morning. I understand it's a letter that you wrote dated uh, December 18th, 2020. If we could turn to page three to the last paragraph on the page. If, if I may just offer some clarification. I had a great deal of help among my officials, the deputy minister and his team and my mental officials in composing this letter. Um, and, but, but I adopted it all and added my signature to it. So I am the, the sender of the letter, but it was a, very much a team effort. Okay, so prepared by a number of actors, but you adopt what's said in the letter, or you agree with what is said in the letter? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you. 
So that paragraph, it reads, when foreign states target Canadians, persons residing in Canada or their families, they are seeking to deprive members of Canadian communities of their fundamental rights and freedoms. Such actions are unacceptable. If anyone feels intimidated or threatened, it is of the most importance to contact your local police. And I can assure you that your concerns will be dealt with in a serious and appropriate manner. Uh, do you remember this uh, sentiment being prepared or your No, ma'am, uh, this is something that, that I believe very strongly in. I, 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 I want, if people feel that they are being subject to th threats or intimidation, it's really important that they, they reach out for, for the help that's available to them. If we could please pull up COM 155 and turn to paragraph 289 on page 106 of the document. This is NSI COP's 2019 annual report. And I'll just wait for us, it might take a moment for it to load. Maybe in the meantime, in the interest of time, I can read it out and we'll just make sure that it's up there. Um, so in paragraph 289 at page 106, it notes, in a spring 2019 presentation to the Standing Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade, Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada noted that those who are targeted do not know whether to turn to CSIS, the RCMP, or municipal police, and that they rarely receive a coherent response from officials. Likewise, um, and, and if, if you'd like, I, we can wait it, to see it. Yes, yeah. I think it would be better to have the document. Certainly. At least the paragraph, the document is there, but. It, can you repeat the paragraph number? Sure. So it's at paragraph 289. Uh, you'd like me to read it out loud again, Madam Commissioner? No, paragraph 29. Uh, 289. Uh, 289, sorry. Here you are. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Now I've got. It'll be on. Are we on uh, page 106 of the document, or perhaps the PDF? I or the document. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It, it, it was the, the, the paragraph in question. Oh, 289 is, is open for me. Okay. I think I'm just making sure that it matches. Uh, could we try the PDF? The PDF page 106. My apologies, I should have taken note of which one it was. Um, okay, perhaps we can move on. Uh, I apologize there. Um, at the start of these hearings, we heard from a panel of representatives from diaspora community organizations who explained that members of targeted diaspora communities often think it's a waste of time to even try to contact the police because in their experience, nothing comes of it or they get bounced around to different agencies. Are you aware that community members are experiencing these difficulties when they attempt to contact law enforcement for help? Yeah, I've, I've been a police officer in one of the most diverse cities in the world for very, very many years and work very hard in, in those diverse communities to make sure that they can know and trust uh, that the police will respond appropriately. One of the things I attempted to do in the letter that I published to parliamentarians and tabled in parliament was to actually provide for Canadians the, the direct contacts with both CSIS and the RCMP. It's, it's articulated in that letter. But one of the reasons I made reference to local police is because if there is an immediate threat to someone's safety and they're concerned for their safety, that's, that's a 911 call. And, and it's really important that Canadians know that if they make that call, that somebody will come there and help them be safe. And, and that's the information. And, and, and I would also acknowledge to you that many diaspora communities you know, often come from um, cultural experiences which makes them untrustful of the police. And it really is incumbent upon all police services, the RCMP and CSIS, to, to make a very sincere effort to build trust in those communities so that people know that if they, they need help, they'll get help. And speaking specifically to reports of foreign interference through perhaps tip lines, web forums for public reporting, are you aware that diaspora communities are having difficulties accessing those mechanisms? I'm, I'm not, but, but that would be a concern to me because th those are established in order to help keep people report their concerns and to be safe. 
And, and I think it, it, your question highlights the need for us to do, to do more, to make sure we reach out to those communities, make it available to them in ways which are both language and culturally appropriate, so that people can trust that, that if they need help, they'll get it. And so by virtue of the fact that you've recognized that there's a lot more work to do to make sure that law enforcement can properly address the concerns of diaspora communities or they can properly engage in that reporting, access help, does that change your opinion as to whether or not you can assure Canadians that their concerns will be dealt with in a serious and appropriate manner by law enforcement as you, as it was stated in that letter? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I can tell you that I, I, I have represented uh, Canadian Police Services across this country as, as the president of the National Association. Um, I work very closely with my colleagues in, in policing at all levels of policing in this country. I believe this is a very sincere effort to reach out to diaspora's communities and to, and to ensure that we are there for them um, in a way that is both language and culturally appropriate. Um, building trust is, is, is a con requires a constant effort. Um, I, part of that is, is providing um, those citizens with a reassurance that uh, that, that we will answer their call and that we will respond in an appropriate way. And I've tried to provide that reassurance in this document. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Council for uh, Michael Chung. Thank you, Commissioner. No questions. No questions. Conservative Party. Good morning, Minister Blair. Just morning, bear sir. with me. I've had to change equipment here. Uh, Minister Blair, in your witness statement uh, at WIT uh, 63, perhaps we can get that called up. Paragraph 12, sir. You discuss approving judicial warrants under the CSIS Act. That's correct. As Minister of Public Safety. And am I correct that your evidence has indicated there that it usually takes you two and a half to three hours to review on and sign off on such warrants? And that's it's approximately, it depends on, on the complexity of, of the application, but that's usually the amount of time that, I'm, that it takes. Okay. And in your experience, uh, including as a police officer uh, and former chief of police, would you agree that uh, warrants and applications for warrants are often very time sensitive? Yes, sir. And you'd agree that delay in approving a warrant or, or applying for a warrant could jeopardize an investigation and the evidence that you're actually seeking to obtain uh, under the warrant? No, I think I think there always has to be a balance of uh, there's an appropriate due diligence of officials in the preparing preparation of those documents. There are also issues around duty of candor and, and other matters that need to be addressed. But certainly, any any undue delay is 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 can be problematic. Right, it could jeopardize the investigation. Depending on the investigation, but yes. Okay. Can I get MC 000053 called up? And Minister Blair, uh, this is an article from the Globe and Mail dated May 19, 2023, which generally deals with foreign interference from China. And it also includes an assertion at the top of page two. Perhaps we can scroll to that. Commissioner, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, uh, Mr. DeLuca. I just wanted to raise a potential concern as to the um, uh, whether or not this line of questioning maybe go beyond the scope of uh, these uh, first set of hearings, which are uh, directed, uh, as, the, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, to the uh, allegations of foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 uh, general elections information flow relating to those and uh, decision uh, to decision makers. Um, uh, as noted, uh, other related issues uh, in respect of foreign interference may be um, addressed at later proceedings. I see what is the line of questioning. Uh, Sorry. Uh, 
just go on with your okay. question and I see whether uh, okay. we sure. are outside the scope of this sure. space or not. So, so there's, a, there's a passage that, that's highlighted in the document itself in, in purple. Perhaps you could read that to yourself to save me from reading it into the record. But, but generally, uh, it suggests that there was undue delay uh, in uh, your signing off on a warrant for um, uh, to, to surveil Michael Chan in the lead up to the 2021 federal election. Can, can you comment on why it took so long for you to um, uh, sign off on the warrant? Yeah, let me comment. This paragraph is false. What aspects of it are false, sir? It, there was no delay of several months. The document in, in question right. uh, was put in front of me on May the 11th. I signed it off the same day, about three hours later. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is um, Jenny Kwan, counsel for Jenny Kwan. Commissioner and, and uh, Mr. Blair. Uh, Mr. Blair, I would like to ask you some questions about CSIS's threat reduction measure uh, power and your oversight of that. My understanding is that you as the minister have oversight over any TRMs that CSIS may want to pursue. That's correct. And just to understand, uh, what does oversight mean in this case? Are you required to approve any such TRMs? The, the the CSIS, when a TRM would, would be sought by, by CSIS, they would, co would come and brief me, um, uh, seek my, my concurrence. My understanding of the legislation doesn't necessarily require my approval per se, but it does require that CSIS make me aware of it and, and that I concur with, it, with the actions taken. Were there... Um, so just to take a step back then, uh, could you approach CSIS about a potential situation in which you felt a TRM was appropriate? There would be nothing to limit my ability to do that. Okay. Um, and in the context of foreign interference and during your tenure, did CSIS approach you of any TRMs that were related to or targeted to foreign interference? No, not specifically. There were things that did not meet the threshold of, of, of CSIS seeking authority for a TRM, but there were a number of, I think, really important and relevant discussions with respect to very serious concerns that CSIS had with respect to, for example, foreign interference um, in some of our health sciences institutions and research institutions. And we discussed measures that could be taken in response to that. And as a result, um, CSIS took the steps of very proactively going to those institutions, briefing those institutions, alerting them to the, the, the nature of the risk and helping them take steps to mitigate that risk. Okay, so that's an example of a TRM during your tenure that was brought to you by CSIS and that you concurred with and then mm -hmm. was taken and, and actually um, implemented. Yes. Okay. Were there any examples where you brought to CSIS uh, the possibility of using a TRM to address a foreign interference issue? No. No. And um, were you briefed or made aware of um, CSIS's TRM undertaking just before you became minister uh, to brief candidates uh, of foreign interference related issues during the election? One, we, I did have discussion, and I had some awareness that, that CSIS intended to proactively uh, speak to, uh, uh, frankly, I had a concern that I discussed with the director about members of parliament or candidates who might be unconsciously influenced or, or interfered with as a result of the action of a hostile government. And, and I felt it was important to give those individuals enough information so that they would recognize the, the interference and to alert them to how that they might take steps in order to protect themselves and to make sure that they knew that CSIS was there to help them and, and support them. And, and so we did have discussions. Um, CSIS did not tell me specifically who they, they wanted to talk to or the information that they would share with them. But, but we did talk about the importance of what is sometimes called defensive briefings or proactive briefings for, of, that CSIS would undertake with an individual, sometimes parliamentarians or, or candidates. And so based on the evidence you're giving now, would you have known not necessarily who was briefed or what they were told, but that the briefing actually occurred? No, there, there, was, there was no reporting mechanism whereby they, the, CSIS would tell me who they were going to talk to 
or if they had in fact talked to anybody, at no time did CSIS come back and say to me while I was the Minister of Public Safety that they had actually conducted a defensive briefing or that they were intending to do so. We talked about the process, but, but, but CSIS did not share with me the information of anyone that they felt that it was necessary to talk to or what information they wanted to share with that individual. So in the oversight function that you had, it was to sort of concur on these TRMs, but did you have any sort of oversight function to determine if the TRMs were an effective means of producing a particular result, or is that left entirely to CSIS to do? Well, it, it, it's an operational matter for CSIS, and so the information that they had, um, it, it, ministerial oversight, if, if I made it, it did not mean that I was sort of overseeing and actively engaged in managing their inquiries, their intelligence gathering, or their even their operations um, in, in order to mitigate threat. It, it was to provide ministerial direction as, as, as on priorities and where it was necessary for them to seek authority to provide that authority. But the, the decisions with respect to the operational response, the gathering of intelligence, the sharing of intelligence and information that they would take to mitigate the, the, the nature of threat was the responsibility of CSIS. Thank you for your testimony. It's very Thank helpful very clarification. Thank you. Uh, Council for Andan. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. Um, if I could ask the court reporter please to pull up WIT 64 again, page 5, paragraph 13. So, Minister Blair, um, you have already had some discussions uh, about the briefing that's addressed in this paragraph with Mr. Cameron this morning. I'd just like to clarify uh, a particular aspect of your evidence. So, looking at paragraph 13 here on the screen, you said that you were not concerned about the intelligence regarding Don Valley North at the time you were briefed. Is that right? I think it was important to be to be briefed on this by CSIS, but it, don't, it did not raise concerns for me based on the information that CSIS provided, that with respect to this process or any compromise of, 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 of the election, or uh, there was no indication in their briefing that Mr. Uh, Dong was a willing or even an aware participant in this. Okay, thank you. And I just want to put a point on what we see here is that you actually gave three specific reasons that you weren't concerned about the intelligence at the time. And I was just hoping that um, to the extent you've not already spoke about them, you could just do so now, those three reasons. Yeah, if I, if I may, just going through the, 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 the three reasons that I, I shared in my uh, t earlier testimony, um, I, I did make inquiries about the source of, of this information, whether or not it was single source or multiple, whether or not this individual had previously provided information which, which was termed reliable or not, whether there was any corroborative evidence or other elements of the CSIS investigation that would substantiate uh, the, the intelligence in this thing. I think it's important to recognize that intelligence isn't necessarily truth. But it's 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 it is the beginning of other inquiries, and it and it has to be assessed in a, in a broad context of of reliability in order to make a determination of next steps. Uh, the second thing that I, I specifically inquired about was whether or not that that there was any intelligence or suggestion that Mr. Dong uh, was aware of the, of of this potential interference or in any way a willing participant. And the, the indication that CSIS provided me with that at that time was that they had no evidence that suggested that. And, and finally, um, I, my, my, my concern, because it had been a longstanding concern about the integrity of our elections, um, whether or not that the, the because this, this briefing was given to me after the 2019 election, whether or not there had been any other uh, interference or in influence that, that could have out influenced the outcome of the 2019 election in Don Valley uh, North, and they indicated that they had no information that indicated that. Okay, thank you. Those are our questions. Thank you. Attorney General? No questions. No question. Re-examination? So you're free to leave. Excuse me, Madam Commissioner, I don't have any re-examination, but I just wanted to make a, a 
observation that uh, we called the Minister Blair to speak to his term as uh, Minister generally and that the uh, timing of any specific uh, incident or warrant is not an issue in this part of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So we'll take a five minutes break to adjust the time to switch witnesses. Order. All right. Alors, s'il vous plaît, the sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is currently uh, in pause. Cette séance de la commission de la gérance est maintenant en pause.